Hello, my name is Michelle Morand. I am co-founder of Cancer Treatment Options and Management and Liquid Biopsy Labs, leaders in precision cancer medicine since it was a thing to be a leader of. And I'm about to introduce you to Alex Rowland, the cancer guy. Um, he's gonna talk to you about some exciting developments specific to prostate cancer, whether castration sensitive or castration resistant. And what I wanted to say before I introduce you to Alex and he shares this uh, new information and these exciting new approvals is that the types of medications that he's going to share with you that have been recently approved for these types of, ca of cancer um, are things that he and his team have been identifying for patients, whether with castration resistant or castration sensitive prostate cancer for many years. So while the rest of the world is just catching up to the benefits of these particular drugs uh, to patients with this type of cancer, Alex and his team have been helping patients with this type of cancer access these types of therapies for quite some time. Um, and experience significant benefits as a result. Um, so Alex is going to tell you all about these new drugs. He's going to tell you um, about how these treatments work um, and how to tell if they will work for you. Definitely not a one-size-fits-all. That's one of the most important things that we've learned about cancer in the last 25 years is it is unique to every person. Your unique genetic signature the multiple mutations that have come together in that perfect storm for you need to be identified and then your treatment needs to be personalized to those molecular features. So here are some exciting new approvals for a new type of therapy for prostate cancer patients. And uh, if you know anybody who has prostate cancer or you yourself are a patient, you will benefit from knowing more about these types of therapies and how to identify which are most beneficial for you and how to get your doctor to prescribe them. Hello, my name is Michelle Morant, and I am here with Alexander Rowland, the cancer guy and co-founder of Cancer Treatment Options and Management and Liquid Biopsy Labs. And uh, Alex is excited today about a couple of new treatments for prostate cancer that are very recently FDA approved, uh, a new type of drug for prostate cancer and in two different cases. So let's hear all about it. If you or someone you love has prostate cancer, it's probably something that you want to know about and stay up on. So Alex, tell us about these new treatments, how they work and why they matter for folks with prostate cancer. Yeah, this is a really exciting development. This class of drugs, PARP inhibitors, is used in other types of cancers. We've been using them in prostate cancers for many, many years and other cancers. And in certain specific cases where they're matched to the genetics of the cancer, they can be incredibly effective. But what's mm -hmm. exciting is these two FDA approvals are for two different indications of prostate cancer. One of the drugs approved for castration sensitive. The other is approved for castration resistant prostate cancer. So the PARP inhibitor, Nirapurib, and the hormone therapy abiraterone, or it's actually an androgen receptor antagonist, is approved for BRCA2 mutated metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. And December 17, 2025, uh, the FDA also approved Recaparib uh, as a single agent metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Okay, so whether you have castration resistant or castration sensitive, there's something about a PARP inhibitor that could be helpful for you. Yeah. How do they determine this? Or what do you want to tell us about the studies and how these things work? Well, first, I think I need to get into a bit of an explanation about how these how they work. Sure. So for, we'll talk a bit about how PARP inhibitors work. They're a fairly simple process. It's the background, it's the genomic background that really makes a difference to whether they work or not. We're also, also okay. going to talk about the classic BRCA somatic mutations and germline mutations. And then we're gonna get into uh, what sort of tests are used to detect these mutations. Okay. So first we need to talk about how HRR, which is the classification here that we're gonna be looking at, is involved in prostate cancer. So basically what HRR stands for is it stands for homologous recombination repair. And when it's broken, it's called homologous recombination deficiency. So HRR or HRD. And there's a class of genes that are associated with HRR. And when they're mutated, they, they, they don't work. And this turns into HRD. 
So basically what homologous recombination is, is when you have a double-stranded DNA and when you get a break in one strand, that gets repaired by many different pathways. However, when you get a break in both strands at the same time, that's called a double-strand break and it's really hard to repair. You know, it's like a compound fracture in a bone for example. So you have to have this, uh, this class of uh, homologous recombination genes to fix that. Mm -hmm. So basically, in short, a break in one strand of DNA double helix can lead to breaks in the complementary strand. So it kind of like weakens it, which then requires the use of the HRR repair genes and pathways. So mm -hmm. HRR deficiency, HRD, occurs when you have mutations in the HRR genes. Got it. Like the ATM check two and the BRCA one and two, you're saying? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So HRR occurs in normal tumor cells. Here's a classic example with the reference below there of how it works in normal cell. In the in the top here, in the blue, we have a mutations that occur in one strand of the DNA. PARP easily fixes that uh, normally. And then what happens is if you have a break in double strands, then that's a homologous recombination pathway. So as you can see down here in the bottom, this is a tumor sample. And so you can have a part fixing the single strand break, but if you would get a double strand break, and I've got that um, little uh, symbol there showing that BRCA2 and BRCA1 are not working, then you have deficient HRD and it results in tumor cell death. So the take home points in this slide are HRR genes such as BRCA, uh, ATM, PALB2, there's probably about 15 of them. These repair double strand breaks. PARP is a gene that repairs single strand breaks. When PARP is inhibited, single strand breaks cannot be repaired properly. This results in more double strand breaks, which require the use of HRR. So when double strand breaks cannot be repaired properly due to mutations in HRR genes, the tumor cells die. And we want that. Yes, we do, yes. So okay. point being is that PARP inhibitors only work in HR deficient tumors. I see. Okay. So, so, so the genes involved with HRD and prostate cancer include BRCA1, 2, ATM, PALB2, but there's a variety of ways these genes can be inhibited. They're not just mutated. So you can have semantic mutations, which are in the tumor only. You can have inherited mutations, which are germline and affect every cell in the body. So you can have inherited BRCA mutations. And then you can have epigenetic silencing, which is basically methylation that silences a gene and turns it off, even though it's not mutated. Mm -hmm. um, but importantly, there are other genes involved with this HRR pathway, not mentioned here. Mm. So I'm just going to look at a couple of them here. And so, as you can see, um, HRR mutations occur for almost 20, you know, almost 27% of prostate cancers. So this is the big game changer for prostate cancer. This slide is a bit of a breakdown and you can see, you know, the different genes and what percentage they're typically found in. This is going to change from study to study, but on average, the most common ones we see are BRCA2. Um, I see a lot of ATM, but uh, typically BRCA2 is the most common one. What about that CDK12? Yeah, that's that's fairly common too. Yes. So important consideration of FDA approved PARP inhibitors. So niraparib is approved for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer with BRCA mutations. Rucapra is approved for metastatic, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer um, with BRCA mutations as well. Both of these have only really been approved in, for, for BRCA you know, BRCA mutations. However, as you can see, there's many other um, HRD deficient genes that can occur. And we've seen PARP inhibitors work in many of them, you know, like right. uh, BRCA, you know, one and two, ATM, check and so on. They don't work as well as with the BRCA mutations uh, because BRCA genes are the fundamental genes involved in HRR, but these other genes are very important too. And so what I wanted to mention here is these drugs do have some efficacy in other HRD related genes. Right. Whether you have the BRCA or not. And the other thing, I probably going to mention this, and I, and I appreciate why you made the distinction between somatic yeah. and the inherited, is that in our healthcare system, we commonly don't test for the somatic version, just the yeah. inherited one. Exactly. And that's a so, Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of doctors get confused between somatic and, and germline mutations. Mm -hmm. 
I've seen many cases where patients are tested with a, a small panel for the germline mutations and they don't have uh, mutations in, um, in the germline, but they do in their tumors. And this yeah. is where these drugs can be very beneficial. Yeah. So testing for HR deficiency, this is done with tumor DNA testing. So yeah. you can use a tissue-based tumor DNA test, or you can also use a liquid-based test. Cool. However, since epigenetic silencing also occurs, it's important to have RNA testing as well, because mm -hmm. you can have a mutation in a, in a HRR gene that is just not known about. You know, there's many, many mutations that can occur in these genes. And mm -hmm. so in order for the mutation to um, create benefits with PARP inhibitors, it has to prevent the function of the gene. And the way you prevent the function of the gene is by looking and seeing if it's expressed or not. And yeah. so also epigenetic silencing, which is a methylation of these genes, in other words, not mutating them, but just turning them off, um, that can also result in benefits. So we, we always recommend tumor RNA expression testing. And so we have videos here that you can follow these links from our Cancer Guy website, one for tumor DNA testing, uh, the other for tumor RNA testing. And I think, I think tumor RNA testing is going to be used a lot more for HRD uh, deficiency. Mm -hmm. Another point that I'd like to make about PARP inhibitors and HRD is since there's so many different genes involved with HRD, it really depends on how many of them are altered in your specific case that will determine how well you benefit from PARP inhibitors. So we've seen people with, you know, five or six different HRD mutated genes or HRR mutated genes, and we see people with only one or two, you know, the BRCA's, the BRCA's. So the more of these genes that are damaged in a particular cancer, the better these PARP inhibitors are going to work. Mm. So, A, testing to find out how many or which ones you have, uh, that's going to give you more confidence that you should try these drugs, really. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Using a proper tumor DNA test that covers all of these genes and not just BRCA1 and 2 will mm -hmm. really help determine just how well these drugs are going to work. Mm-hmm. And where does the RNA fit in then? And so the RNA, um, because we're looking at whether these genes are expressed or not, mm -hmm. we can get a much clearer picture on um, whether, you know, these genes are turned on or off. And if they're turned off, you're going to get a really good benefit from the PARP inhibitors. Interesting. You have so much knowledge. Sometimes the things that are so obvious to you are are, are not to, to most. And I think one thing... A, a, a distinction I'd just like to enhance from what you were just saying about the DNA and the RNA is the DNA DNA tests that are available commercially now, they don't look at the whole gene. No. They look at whenever the test was made, were the parts of a gene, and there's however many billion of base pairs that where you could have a mutation on a gene. Yeah. And so they're looking at one little one little part. And if you don't have the mutation right there, yeah. the DNA test will say you don't have the mutation. Yeah. But, and this is this is specifically a real problem when you get a basic HRR test. So there are actually DNA tests designed just for HRR, but they typically only look at BRCA1 and 2. Right. Yeah. They're looking at, a, you know, the analogy I always use is that, you know, you've lost your keys in the alley and they're looking under the lamppost, you know, like that's because it's easy because the light because is the there and that's, there. Yes. you know, yeah. and the reality is they need to go down, down the alley folks and, and find those keys, you know, or in this case, find the, find the key to your cancer care. So while DNA DNA tests, yeah. um, even if they talk about looking at 300 or four or whatever genes, um, they're looking at just a piece of a gene. And what Alex is saying about the RNA is it looks at the whole gene and it will indicate if there's a problem anywhere on that gene. And of course, the most important thing for you as a patient or an advocate for a patient is to make sure that you have as much information as you 
can possibly have so that then you can circle back around to your healthcare team and say, hey, I know whatever you guys tested me for BRCA1 maybe and I didn't have that, but I've got these three other genes that, and I have a lot of them. That's what the RNA test tells us, how much of each gene is a problem for you. So it's a great way to make sure you're getting the most thorough assessment, but also that you have the evidence you need to get on the treatment you need really. Um, So lots of folks don't understand that distinction between RNA and DNA and that most DNA tests are looking not at a whole gene, but just one piece um, based on what was understood about that gene whenever that test was developed. And some of the most popular tests that doctors recommend, at least in Canada, are like 15 years old, haven't been updated in a long time. Yeah. And so I, as I always say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what the mutation is. It matters how it affects the gene. You know, so there's so many different mutations that won't be, you know, won't be included in the HRD panel that are actually causing HRD. And you never know it unless you actually looked at the RNA and the tumor RNA expression. You know, basically the mechanism is if a gene is mutated, it's not going to be as highly expressed. And that's the general theme that you need to consider. Mm -hmm. And you can determine expression through RNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, a whole gene and all of them, every single gene, 20,813 of them. So, okay, let me recap here. So we have these two new approvals for PARP inhibitors specific to this homologous repair uh, and or the deficiency thereof, whether you have castration resistant or not. Yes. Uh, prostate cancer. And what I did, what I didn't see, but I'm, I'm assuming you have some information about this is what kinds of benefits can this protocol provide people versus what is currently done kind of chemo and abiraterone or whatever? Yes, exactly. Um, what, what I really like about this is it's the approvals. You know, they're saying, yes, we can use them finally in prostate cancer. I mean, we've known that we could use them in prostate cancer for many years. Studies have been very conclusive, but finally the FDA has made an approval. And this approval is going to expand to different mutations over time. So right. this is just a starting point. So okay. whether if you have prostate cancer, definitely get tested. We see probably in castration resistant, high grade uh, prostate cancers, we see probably 40% of them have HR deficiency. Okay. Yeah. So it's a new. Well, worth testing and get your RNA tested as well. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Right. For the, for the reasons that we talked about, that way you're covering the whole gene and, and a much broader scope uh, as well. Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Follow up slide here. If you want to book a one-on-one consultation with us, I think it's an excellent thing to do. Um, we're going to give you unbiased assessment of all the different treatment options that could be available for you now. And then remember to subscribe to the Cancer Guy. We're going to be doing a video a week. There'll be new videos and new drugs as they're coming out. You don't have to wait for your doctor to uh, tell you about them. Best you don't. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you, Alex.